I think <coughs> World War I uh, is the most forgotten important event in human history. It's something that really gets pushed aside and it's rather appalling. And I only came to feel this more and more as I was assembling this book. I am a biographer by trade. I write about 20th century American culture as a rule. If you don't know about the Library of America, I hope you will get to know about it. It's a fantastic organization that is celebrating its 35th anniversary this year um, and publishes, if you've gone into a bookstore, these wonderful books of the great American authors from the beginning of this country, from colonial times, uh, in these beautiful tuxedoed, uh, jacket, uh, jacketed books. I mean, they're all black and they're rather uniform and quite wonderful. About every two years, the Library of America decides to do a more thematic book, rather than dedicating a whole volume, or in the case of Henry James, eight or nine volumes to his complete works. They pick a theme, they pick a, a subject and do a book on that, such as a three volumes set on, on the Civil War, writing about the Revolutionary War, writing about Vietnam. There's a great two-volume uh, set they have done called Reporting Vietnam, um, all well worth looking at. Uh, but a few years ago, it occurred to the Library of America, as it had not occurred to many people in Washington, D.C., I should say, uh, that the centenary of America's entry into World War I was approaching, and here we are, this is it. Uh, in April of 1917, uh, this country declared war on Germany and we went to war. It was, well, it was the greatest cataclysm the world had ever seen, quite simply. And what this book set out to do, and they, they sort of hooked me into it, they, I think it was a bit of a they didn't switch, if you want to be honest, in the way they got me. They knew I knew a lot about World War I. They kept writing me saying, do you have any people you could, uh, I, knew, I wrote about Wilson. So they said, could you, um, you know, send us some names of people who will, you know, could put this book together. And I kept giving them these wonderful names. And, uh, and finally, the third letter, well, actually third phone call, uh, was, uh, anybody else come to mind? Um, uh, anyway, I, are you asking me to do this book? Yes, okay, now here's where the bait and switch came in, and I thought that's great because one thing about World War I that often gets forgotten is it created what may be the greatest generation of writers in American <coughs> history, American literature. Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Faulkner, Dos Passos, the, the list goes on and on. And I thought, oh, that's wonderful. I'd love to you know, get some of those voices. And, well, I'm signed up, I'm all doing it. Oh, no, 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 we're just doing nonfiction. Oh, yeah, what the book is, is World War I and America as told by the Americans who lived it. And so what they wanted to do, and this actually I'm, I'm really happy with what it turned into, is just using non-fiction voices. So even if we have some of the greatest novelists in the world writing and appearing in this book, uh, they are writing non-fiction, not fiction. So these are some of the things I wanted to do with the book. It is a most formidable task because it's a big question of condensation, how to do this, um, it's how to talk about this incredible war, how to talk about this nation, how to talk about the world which changed so dramatically as it did in the four years the war was fought, in the some two years that the United States was part of the war, and certainly in the aftermath. So putting it together became the real challenge. The biggest challenge being how to include as many constituencies as possible in telling the story. The story is not just some doughboys who went overseas and fought a war. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the question was, how many voices could I get into this book telling how many different facets of this particular story? Therein lay the challenge. So putting it all together, unlike my colleague here today, Barry, and as Karen um, and, uh, has already suggested, uh, we have um, a slightly different mission here. I am putting this book entirely together with documents. I do deal with not just the dead, but I want them on paper. 
Um, and that's, that's the essence of what makes up this particular book. Um, today's oral histories, which are extremely important, they are, of course, most important to me because they're tomorrow's documents. And they are something that we can then play with, work with, deal with. The important thing, and I don't want to tell Barry how to do his job, <laughs> but the, the important thing to me, or the most exciting thing to me in putting this book together, in putting together some 130 pieces that narrate World War I, is that the authors of these pieces, none of them knew when they wrote what they wrote, for the most part, how the war was going to turn out. So it is written with the excitement of what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, a lot of what is contained in this book are diaries, are letters, a home to sweethearts, um, and they don't know what's happening. They don't know if we're winning the war. They don't know what the outcome is going to be a century later. We did not include people like Barbara Tuckman and other great historians of World War I who wrote 50 or 60 years later about it. This is what was going on in the moment or almost immediately thereafter. This has the account of a guy on the Lusitania, you know, who gets off the ship and does his diary that night. He survives but tells the tale. So that's the kind of immediacy, exigency, that I was trying to go for in putting this book together. So where to begin? There are obviously tens of thousands of things to deal with. The brilliant uh, Library of America um, has uh, several wonderful advisory boards of historians, among other things, and they submitted a great number of things uh, that we really should consider uh, including in the book. Then within that, we had four specialists really in World War I and its era uh, to select from that. Um, or actually just to throw suggestions in. And then there's the Library of America itself, which has a wonderful team of editors. And then there was me. I mean, I spent 13 years writing the life of Woodrow Wilson. Needless to say, I had done a lot of reading um, in the World War I era. So I had a lot of things I wanted to include in this book. Um, and as I was thinking about it, I could start to see that it would take some shape. And I began to see what I see as a biographer. That when I write a life story, when I write the life of Max Perkins, the book editor, or the life of Woodrow Wilson, the president, it is not enough simply to narrate, to chronicle that life. You must also illuminate the times. <coughs> what were the times in which your subject lived? And how did those times influence your subject? Um, it's cross currents all the time. And that was one of the important things in putting this particular uh, volume together as well. Now, I had a good head start, and I think they were really wise uh, to bring me on to do this book. Um, not for all the obvious reasons, but, but for, one, for one really big reason, which is Woodrow Wilson. Whether you know much about him or not, whether you like him or not, Woodrow Wilson was the dominant voice of the era, really of at least the first half of the 20th century. And I recognized, especially in the four <coughs> years of the war, he was the outstanding voice from beginning to end. And I knew that Woodrow Wilson was going to become the tent poles of my book. And I think the Library of America had rather sensed that as well. Uh, not only was he the greatest scholar we have ever had in the White House, he was possibly the most eloquent president we have ever had. He also wrote everything down. Woodrow Wilson is a man who left no thought unexpressed. <laughs> um, uh, and just as a little bonus, um, although a nightmare for people who write about him, because he did keep nothing unexpressed, he even knew shorthand. So. So anything that popped into his head, he would just jot it down. And then there'd be a draft, and then there'd be eight more drafts, and then he would deliver a speech. That being said, he was also a brilliant speaker impromptu. He could just go out there, and on most of his campaign speeches, which are some of the most dazzling ever delivered, he delivered just off the cuff, and somebody would transcribe them. 
and one goes through those speeches and you don't find a misplaced word, you don't find a sentence that does not logically follow its predecessor, and there it was. So, I knew I had this to work with, and indeed I did set up those ten poles. Now, the next thing I wanted to do, a book such as this, is about voices, and that's what Barry captures, that's what we all want to capture here, are the voices. And I thought that was such a, a telling remark about the military thought process and how you're part of a team, and, and yet that makes it so difficult to individuate. And yet that is something that I think we all must aim to do, because everybody has got a story. Everybody has a backstory. Everybody um, has the story they lived, and in some ways, everybody's story impacts somebody else's. So that's always going through my mind while I'm putting this book together. Among the first things I considered, obviously, were I need fam the famous voices in this book, because people are going to open it up and say, okay, obviously I want to see what Woodrow Wilson had to say about the war. I want to see uh, what his great rival, Teddy Roosevelt, had to say about the war. You know, war broke out in Europe in the summer of 1914. For most of the next four years, Woodrow Wilson, as he famously campaigned in 1916, kept us out of war. This nation had one of the three or four great debates in its history around 1914, 15, 16, up to 1917. What is our role? What are we doing? Do we have a place in the war? Do we have a place in the world? And that was something I obviously wanted to get expressed in this volume, was the great debate. So we had Woodrow Wilson, who was trying to keep us out as long as possible. We had Teddy Roosevelt arguing all the time about what a weak sister Woodrow Wilson was and how do we get into the war. Now we have Woodrow Wilson's pacifist Secretary of State, William Jennings Bryan, who says we must not get in at all. And President Wilson, I see you tugging us inch by inch into this war, but this is a mistake. So I wanted William Jennings Bryan, William Jennings Bryan's voice in there. Uh, then you've got Eugene Debs, the socialist. What is his role during this period as he is giving speeches telling people to resist the draft and he will ultimately be thrown into jail for sedition? Well, and of course the famous clear and present danger of judgment. Uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes was passed down, you know, over these acts, such as Debs's. Uh, so, I wanted those. It was a period also of great journalism. And journalism, famously the first draft of history. But it's special during World War I because there were some great first draft writers, I must tell you. The likes of John Reed, the likes of Richard Harding Davis, uh, Nellie Bly, who is just a name to some people, but was this rather adventurous a journalist who wrote extremely well. H.L. Mencken, a great voice of the day. What did he have to say, especially being a German-American, as we seem to be drifting into this war against uh, Germany? And now, as I already tip my hand, we have this era of incredible novelists that are going to emerge after the war. So many of them had wartime experiences, uh, most of them before we were actually in the war, so they were ambulance drivers, they were working for the Red Cross, they were doing whatever to get over there. So I obviously wanted somehow to get in the voices of Hemingway, of, of Faulkner, of John Dos Passos, uh, but because we were sticking to our nonfiction rule, what about those letters home that Ernest Hemingway was writing to his parents, in which he is talking about um, his, his getting uh, shot up uh, in Italy. And we all know that's going to get translated into a farewell to arms. That's going to become fiction. But what does that look like as raw nonfiction? What does that look like simply as a letter home to mom? So I wanted that stuff included in the book. And then, of course, I wanted what's going on in contemporary life, songs. What songs were people singing? Well, it's George M. Cohan's over there. It's how you're going to keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris. 
after the war is over. So you need this kind of stuff, because these, the, these are the themes, the threads that, that lace through throughout the book. Um, and then even jokes. I mean, Will Rogers really became the first political satirist um, of, in America. So why not have a few of his jokes sprinkled in and out uh, throughout the book? So we know what people were worried about and what people were laughing about. And how did they do it? So after the famous writers, of course, I needed to turn to the real heart of the book, the meat of the book, and those are the unfamous. And by and large, those are the soldiers who went over there. Um, they are farm boys. Uh, they are mechanics. They amazingly, so many of them, well, not amazingly, wrote letters home, but that so many of them did diaries it was absolutely fascinating and it is an absolute gold mine uh, for historians for who can then translate that into some book for future researchers and readers above all. And the women who went to war, there was a cohort of nurses, hundreds, thousands of women, again, even before we were in the war, who just left home uh, to go overseas to, to nurse these soldiers uh, who were encountering, you know, and not even American soldiers in, in so many cases. They were so stirred by this particular cause. Um, a woman named Shirley Millard, another named Mary Borden, perhaps the most famous, uh, because she's probably the best of the writers of all the nurses. And just the sheer eloquence. And this is one of the most exciting things about, about having put this book together. Um, <clears throat> I also uh, thought, well, now, what about if we follow somebody like, I mean, we've got to include, what about that captain from Independence, Missouri, who's sending letters home to his sweetheart, his sweetheart, Bess? Well, yeah, Harry Truman wasn't yet Harry Truman, but Captain Truman wrote some fantastic letters that really brought the war to life. Um, and there he was, of course, a vet. So in capturing that, I then began to think, all right, we've also got to capture the experience of war which goes beyond the battlefield. Wars, as I suggest in my introduction to this book, are the greatest game changers a nation can go through. And this country, in particular, completely changed. Our economy changed. Our foreign policy changed. Um, the role of women in America changed. Women got the vote uh, because of the war. Woodrow Wilson insisted this was a war measure. Race in this country, uh, which still has a long, long way to go, changed drastically during World War I in large measure because of how little was done. And in fact, I mean, it was a segregated army uh, and they were segregated veterans who came home. And that in large measure, when several hundred thousand, some 400,000 black soldiers returned from the war, having shed the same blood that white soldiers shed, they were expecting this country to turn around, and it did not. They were treated the same as they were before the war, if not worse. And as a result of that, all you have to do is pull out a calendar, and that is the summer of 1919 is famously known as the Red Summer because race riots broke out all across the country, not just in the South, everywhere in this country, and it was in large measure because the black soldiers felt they had been unrecognized and they were now still being pushed down. And this is the moment the modern civil rights movement really takes off. So, and then I mentioned, of course, you know, the biggest change in the arts occurs in the, in the writing, in the great fiction. You know, you have to remember, you know, Jay Gatz, who becomes the great Gatsby, uh, met Daisy during World War I. Uh, William Faulkner's first book was Three Soldiers. Uh, Ernest Hemingway uh, writes about the post-war disillusionment, um, certainly in The Sun Also Rises and then famously in uh, Farewell to Arms. So what did I learn from all this? I want to give you three or four big bullet points. 
The first is, you know, the great literary critic Edmund Wilson said, it is hard to imagine any era in which more great writing came than from the Civil War, and how much great writing there was from the Civil War, from again, just farm boys, quite largely. Well, I would stack up the writing of World War I alongside the Civil War, and it is still just so remarkable to me how eloquent even some of the most unschooled soldiers were, and in some cases absolutely elegant uh, in their thinking and in their phraseology. The war has to have something to do with this. I mean, these are obviously largely uh, men and women uh, who went over there uh, knowing their Bibles, so they knew that biblical language. A lot of them knew Shakespeare uh, because it was taught in even elementary schools. But there's something further about, I think, so many people facing these life and death situations. I think it brings a kind of honesty and clarity, and I'm sure Barry will have something close to this to say. Um, and I think that really keeps popping up in this book. It's not just the professional writers who carry the day in, in this um, anthology. The second big thing uh, I dealt with, uh, and it's something because the Library of America said, oh, by the way, you've got to write an introduction for this book. And as we sorted out the pieces, um, and again, looking for, at all times, I needed stories that advance the story of the war and illuminate a particular aspect of humanity, of American life, of what was going on in the world. Um, my job was not only to select the pieces, but to write headnotes for each of them in which I actually tell how the war was progressing. Are we in it yet? Are we getting closer? How's the fighting going? What's happening here? What's happening in Armenia? You know, so that you get that. So part of it was to be the editor selecting. Part of it was to write these head notes that tell the story, just kind of pure objective history, kind of the settings to set up the stones that are the great pieces we've included. <clears throat> but also in an introduction, when I finally had gathered the some 130, 40 pieces, it occurred to me there was a through line to them all. And there was a theme that I hadn't thought about. And this ties into, I think, everything we're all doing. And that is identity. Everybody's got one. Everybody wants one. Everybody wants to be recognized for his or her identity. And I realized that World War I got started because of an identity crisis. Because over in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was a cobbled together kind of false country, if you will, this huge empire, in which one end of the empire had nothing to do with the other end. You know, Bosnians, Serbs, you know, Hungarians, they, they were fighting each other because they wanted to, they wanted to exert, they wanted to express their own identities. And in fact, people who actually started the war said this is what it was about. You will find people here in America uh, trying to figure out what is our role. And as a result of the American presence in World War I, our identity completely changed from an isolationist country with an army that was 17th or 18th in the world. We were somewhere between Portugal and Serbia, okay? You can figure out the first 15. It was almost any country you've heard of, but it wasn't the United States. And as a result of World War I, we became the first modern superpower in the world. We became this incredibly strong, militarily strong nation that the world looked to. And we began to redefine, largely through Woodrow Wilson's speeches, what our identity was. That it was our job to see that the world was made safe for democracy. And so in the end, everything changed in this country, in the world, because of World War I. And again, whether to this day you think we should have gone into the war, whether you think it was right or wrong, 
whatever you feel about it, make no mistake, everything goes back to that war for the last century. 